Thank you. Well, welcome everyone. We're so excited to have you here today as we discuss how to create focus in your workplace um, or in your workspace. Um, so, you know, post COVID, during COVID, we've all moved into the, the home workspace or a lot of us have. And so it's really about leveraging that flexibility to make it exactly what you want it to be and be the most productive you can be. So my name is Rex. I am the training enablement manager here at Text Expander, and I'm based in Louisville, Kentucky. It is a really fun space. If you've never been, I highly recommend it. Come for Derby, stay for the food. Um, and yes, I can play six instruments. So saxophone, flute, clarinet, bassoon, oboe, and somewhat piano. I'm still struggling with getting my hands to do two different things at the same time. Um, but yeah, love to play music. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer to introduce herself. Hi, I'm Jennifer Burnett, and I am a customer success manager with Text Expander. I live in Ohio, um, in the States, in Ravenna, Ohio, to be specific. And a little fun fact about me is that I once played Doris Day in a musical, so I am musically inclined as well, just not with instruments, more with my voice. Um, so I am a uh, first soprano um, a vocalist. Um, and I am going to be helping out Michael and Rex during today's webinar. So if you have any questions, please feel free to drop those into that question and answer box at the bottom of your Zoom chat or your Zoom control panel. Um, if you pop it into the chat room, I'll try to, you know, to grab those out, but let's try to keep the questions in the question and answer box, but it's a pleasure and we're so glad that you guys are with us. And now over to Michael. Hi everybody, thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Michael Fouché, I'm the Director of Product at Shift. Uh, we are based in beautiful Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. Uh, fun fact, my middle name is Juan. Uh, which is, I was named after my godfather, who actually is, connection to the States, is Guamanian from Guam. And that's how I came up and got the middle name Juan. Uh, so I have, you know, an English first name, a Spanish middle name, and a French last name. So that's... that's multicultural. That's multicultural, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, welcome. Today we are going to cover some some tips on how to like prep your physical space to be the most productive, stay fresh, how to do some or some tips on automation um, and also some levity. Um, also digital tips, how to avoid Zoom fatigue and tab overload. Also talking about automation in the digital space, not just the physical space. And then some mental tips, talking about the planning phase, talking about working smarter and not harder and how to get your, start your day off the most prepared as possible so that you can just keep winning all day. So let's talk about your physical space, how to make it your own and how to find moments to treat yourself to a bit of rest or refreshing. All right, thanks Rex. Um, so, Probably like many of you two years ago when this thing called the pandemic started um, and all of us had to move back to our house and set up these temporary offices and, and if you didn't have one in your house. Um, and then all of a sudden, like me, uh, I found myself, I was on Zoom like six hours a day. Um, and it was, it was a little overwhelming. And I don't know many of you, if you had a laptop or whatnot, the, the video cameras on these laptops and desktops are actually not very good. They do not often put your best foot forward. So, and I was tired of looking at my face for six hours a day in this uh, not very good uh, experience. So I had a DSLR sitting in a bag that sat in the bag for, you know, 99% of the year until you went on a big holiday and pull it out. And I thought, well, you know what, I'm going to try to do something and use that. And I did some research and figured out a way to connect up a nice camera. I had some good lenses to my computer. And it's kind of what you're seeing now. But, you know, one of the things that happened is, you know, this is how it looked, you know, at 720p terribleness, as I like to call it. And, um, you know, I connected it up and now, you know, you get to view me in 1080p glory for better or worse, depending on your opinion. Um, 
But it, one of the things, you know, it seems like, okay, why would I do this, go through it? But for me, it just made me feel a little bit better about putting my best foot forward. And if you're going in business meetings or whatnot, it just, it seemed to help. And it, you know, one of those small comforts that took a little bit of effort, but after it was done, um, I, I don't look back and I feel much better about that, you know, quite an investment in that expensive camera that used to sit in a bag 99% of the year. And if any of you have that uh, problem, you know, mention it in the chat. If you have a, you know, an expensive camera sitting there that you don't use, let us know because um, it's an opportunity to put it to some good use. Absolutely. I also think it's important to find ways to stay fresh throughout the day. And one of my biggest tricks or my tips is to use a virtual camera. So once you followed Michael's tip to get yourself a really nice 1080p glory camera, um, you can also then smooth out the face with a virtual camera. So a virtual camera is a piece of software that kind of sits between the camera and whatever uh, conference software that you're using. So it would, when I'm in Zoom, instead of saying like, use my camera built into my display, I say use Snap camera. So I use Snap camera as a virtual camera. It allows me to do some fun things like it refreshes your skin a little bit, or you can even inject a little bit of levity into your meetings um, with different, um, I guess you would call them filters. So maybe sometimes you want to be an anime character or you want to have um, a Pixar face. So this is a really fun way to maybe have a fun meeting. Um, be a comic book character if you like. Um, it's For me, it, it, it injects a little bit of fun into my meetings during the day, but also when I need to be serious, I still look fresh, but even if I don't feel fresh. Um, and I think that's really fun and important. Um, like Michael mentioned earlier, you know, it was it's not just about how it is for the other people on the call. It's about how it makes it feel about you feel about yourself. Um, so when you look at the camera and you see and you're like, oh, I don't look as as tired as I feel. It's a little boost to your day. Um, another way that I stay fresh oh, and is to use a face mist. So I am addicted. I only have three at my desk right now. But throughout the day, if I need a little bit of pick me up, I just mist my face. I really like take a moment, close my eyes take a deep breath, inhale that fragrance and, and let that reset me so that I can tackle whatever project I need to do next, especially those projects that you don't want to do that you've been putting off. Having a little moment of Zen can give you that little push to get through it. Um, I also leverage or I combine that with an oil diffuser. Um, and, you know, whether the benefits are psychosomatic or not, um, it does make me feel better. It makes me maybe feel more motivated. So for me, using a, a smell like mint makes me feel more energized and I feel like ready to tackle a project. Um, so finding those things that work for you, that give you a little zing, that give you a, or a little bit of a, hmm, a release moment. I think it's really important to have those in your, in your arsenal so that you can whip them out whenever you need that pick me up. Yeah. Hey Rex, so we have some questions about what the virtual camera is that you're actually using. Yeah, so it's called Snap Camera, and here I'll actually just pull it over so we can see it. So when you use it, it allows you to go through and pick different uh, filters. You can even make your own. So like if you wanted to make it branded for your company and have like fun stuff floating around, so it can even do like a, f it can watch where your face is. So it's it's related to the same company that does Snapchat, or it is the same company that does Snapchat. And so once you download it, you just change that. Um, when you're in Zoom for your camera selection, you just select Snap Camera and it passes that um, through to your, to your computer. It can work on your, Snap Camera works on your computer. Um, I don't know if there is a phone version of it, but I imagine there may be, um, but it definitely works on your, on your actual computer. So on Windows and Mac. Mm -hmm. um, so it gives you those benefits. I mean, we all, I'm sure on our phones are used to using filters. Um, so this gives you that ability here in your Zoom meetings or your Teams meetings or Google Hangouts, you know, you can still have a nice fresh face or something fun um, without a lot of work. Yeah, and I dropped the link to that in the chat um, so everyone can uh, access that Snap Camera link in the chat. 
Cool. Thank you, Rex. No worries. Oh, there we go. So now we'd like to talk about wrangling the digital wilderness. So I think a lot of times we end up letting technology tell us what to do, or we adapt to work with the technology, how we are perceiving it to, to, to force us to, to interact with it. Um, but I think it's really important to start from the premise that like, you're gonna work for me and we're gonna be collaborative in the sense that like, whatever I need is what I'm gonna, how we're gonna go through this. Don't adapt your process for your technology. Adapt the technology to work for your process. So one thing that I do in this way is I automate things and I am a, I'm a huge tech nerd. So I'm all the time trying to find something new that I can use to make something smart that was not. Um, so one thing that I've done is uh, in front of me is a window that uh, I'm a bit too short to reach to open and close it, especially since my desk is sort of in front of it. So it's, it makes the length even a little bit further. Um, and so I've put a smart uh, servo on it. So it spins and twists the wand. Um, well, the wand's gone, but it would twist the wand if it were there, you, you replace the wand with it. Um, so I can ask my virtual assistant, uh, Siri, to open and close the window. So it will literally open and close the blinds from fully closed to all the way open. Or I can say, open it at 30 degrees and it'll angle the blind just exactly how I want it. So I can use natural light as well in my lighting setup for, for um, Zoom calls. Um, but also I can't deny that it's a huge little like, a little, <laughs> I get really excited whenever I do it because I just walk in in the morning. I'm like, please open the window. Um, and then also I was able to like say, if I leave the house, go ahead and close that window. And so now we're going to make a few more. We're going to try to, we bought like a little Arduino board to program them and little Wi-Fi chips and servos to put together and make more of them for your blinds. So you can replace, um, you don't have to buy all new blinds. You can actually add smart technology to things you already have. So that's where we kind of like try to operate, um, also, I've, add, I've added like tons of smart lights around in my setup so that when I'm not on a call and have the lights up bright, I can have it do a nice little cool, um, relaxing ebb and flow if I want. Just something to like, whatever makes you feel more productive and playing around with it, um, I think is always a fun thing to do. And don't be afraid to tinker. Um, so if you have an idea, I'm certain that there's someone out there in the forums and the internet that can give you a direction to head down. So I'm a hardcore Redditor. I'm always looking for new stuff uh, for smart home. I use HomeBridge to, to get um, smart devices that wouldn't normally work in my Apple uh, HomeKit system to work in there. Um, so like you can really like it's it's almost like an addiction once you get started or like if, if, you are, if you are aware of Pringles, once you pop, you can't stop. So once you start getting a few smart devices, it just, it snowballs from there. You have, everything needs to be smart at that point. It's, that, it's so bad that I even have my coffee pot on a smart outlet so I can wake up and be like, turn on Mr. Coffee. Um, and, and, and then you can roll it into a theme. Like I can just say good morning and it opens my blind, turns on my coffee pot and starts my favorite podcast. And it's a great way to like be energized and have a little bit of excitement or fun at the very beginning of your day. And if you're looking for a good podcast uh, uh, recommendation, I highly recommend Hidden Brain. It's one of my faves. Rex, are you aware of the new standard um, coming out called Matter? Yes, I'm so excited for it. And, so, uh, yeah, why don't you let everyone know what that is? Yeah, so it's a new um, smart home automation standard and big giants have signed on to it like Apple and Google. Um, and what it's based on the, the thread technology, which if you're familiar with other smart home technologies like Zigbee or Z-Wave. It's just a 2.4 gigahertz, um, I guess, area of the spectrum, right? That like allows devices of different manufacturers and, um, and different types of devices to communicate with each other. And the cool thing about Thread is that each device can act as its own router or border router. So like it repeats the signal. So you, theoretically there's more, um, it, it, there's less opportunity for things like dis when when a smart device is Wi-Fi only, maybe your router says like, hey, you, you're not doing anything right now. Why don't you go ahead and like log off? And then that creates a delay 
from when you ask your smart device to do something and it responds because it has to like wake up essentially and, and then do the task that you've asked of it. But Thread allows things to stay connected. And with, with Wi-Fi networks, like there's like, say that depending on your, this is a very uh, dense topic, but like depending on your router and all of that, you might have like, let's say 10 spots for something to be connected. And so having that Thread technology allows you to not worry about those 10 spots that you have open essentially. Um, and then Matter, together with all of that, leveraging the Thread network should mean that you any smart device will work in any ecosystem. So where you know you might have had a device that only worked in Google Home, now leveraging the Thread technology and backend, and for a lot of devices, it should just be a firmware update. Um, now you can add a Google only device into an Apple Home Kit setup, or add an Alexa only device into a Home Kit, or vice versa, and it should create. Um, a lot more uh, interconnectivity, which I'm super excited about because I've definitely cobbled things together and forced them to work as best they can and used API calls and web hooks to make things work. So this should just mean you can sign in and it all works together. <laughs> does that sound like a good explanation, Michael? It does. Yeah, I'm excited about it too because I'm a HomeKit household and anyone else who uses HomeKit the uh, devices are great, but they're often more expensive than the Google and Amazon ones. And this yeah. will kind of level the playing field where you can purchase less expensive items to add to your home and it should work. So that's exciting. I think it'll be a boom for the whole smart home scene because people will no longer have these devices that they get and they can't use. So I'm excited about it. I'm also hoping that it means that like you can have better third party like apps that control everything. Um, because I think all of the apps that I've used so far, there's like great aspects of each of them, but none of them are like a one ring to rule them all. Um, though I do think the Eve app comes pretty closely. So if, if you've not tried that, it's cool. It works over top of HomeKit um, and allows you to do some cool, like especially for automation, um, you can add some extra variables that aren't available to you using the HomeKit app itself. Yeah, if you can put the link to that in uh, in the chat, that would be awesome. Sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, <clears throat> and then, Michael, uh, real quick, before you, before you talk about tabs, because we're going to talk about tabs here, which I'm excited to talk about, I do have a question um, from Gerald regarding a camera. So um, he wants to know, he has a Nikon 3100 DSLR, and he wants to know if the El El Elgato cam link will work to connect that camera, if there is a better or easier way to do that. Oh, that's, that's an excellent question. I'm not 100% sure if the cam link works with that device, but um, I am using the cam link for my uh, Sony uh, 6000, Alpha 6000. So uh, I would just look on the Elgato website to see if that camera is supported uh, for the capture. Um, and I'm pretty sure it probably will be. Some cameras like Canon, there are some DSLRs that you can connect directly to your computer without having to use a capture card, which is nice as well. And I think Canon is one of those companies that does support that tech. Uh, but I can say I really, uh, the Elga Elgato card has been great for me. I've not had a problem with it. Perfect, thank you, Michael. No problem. Okay, I think we can all, Hopefully, and I'll, I, I will ask you if, if any of you suffer from tab overload, but there's a lot of challenges with, with having too many tabs open. And I think many of us suffer from that. If, you, if you're one of those people that has a browser window open and you have so many tabs that the only thing you see is the icon of the website and not even text, you have a problem. <laughs> Uh, and what is the is there a group for that? Yeah, we'll do the support group at the end of the call. <laughs> <laughs> we started it today. <laughs> so you know what is what is the impact of that? Okay, I'm clicking away. There we go. Well, the one thing is you can feel overwhelmed, and it remain. It's hard to stay focused. Now, why is that? Well. 
one of the challenges because you have so many tabs open you just you don't even know where to find the stuff you had the other problem it has is it limits your screen real estate because you have all of these tabs open you're overtaking your desktop and it becomes hard to locate anything that you're looking for and these days like web apps you know people you think it's just a simple web page but now uh, you know you've opened up a, an app now there's often you know, you can open up a web page and 10 to 20 or 30 megabytes of information can be downloaded to your computer. It's essentially downloading an app locally on your browser and it's running logic through JavaScript and other stuff on your computer. If you have several of these open, it begins to become a drain on your computer itself. This can be a problem and it slows down a lot of things. And this is one thing I wanna hear in the chat. How many of you get on a Zoom call and someone says, oh, can you show me that? And you go to show your desktop, but before you do, you hesitate because you look at your browser and there are these hundreds of tabs open. You go, oh my God, I don't want people to see how my brain works. <laughs> and you, beget, you begin to feel like, oh, I'm going to open up a fresh, clean tab and just show that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Pluck it out and put it in a different screen. Exactly. A hundred percent. Don't look at my shame. <laughs> so, you know, here's the question. Like, why do we do this? Like, what is it? And um, I also want to uh, see if anyone can uh, write in the, in, in the chat what, what the tabs on my little uh, image here say. <laughs> Um, yeah, there you go. Send there help. We go. <laughs> um, so, you know, research has shown like we use these tabs as reminders of things that we have to do. You know, you open up, okay, I've got to call the doctor, I'll look up the website, I've got to do this. You put all these tabs and they're all open and they're kind of like use them as a task system. Um, and then often we keep them open because even though you may even forget what they're about, you know, I might spend some time doing that. I, I don't want to have to refine it. So I'm not going to close it. I'll just leave it open. And then over time, it's like, okay, I put a lot of work into this. It's kind of like a sunk cost fallacy. Like you've done all this work. I've made all these tabs. Um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to close them because maybe I might need them. And we often use them as like an external mental model. Um, you know, in my worst days of my tab usage, I would have several windows open, one with, you know, 50 tabs on one research topic and another one over here. So we kind of use them to sort of map out our brain, how we think we're, we're working. And then finally, you know, over time, you're sitting with these tabs for weeks at times, and it's kind of like you have this uncertain relevance, like, what, why did I do that? And it's difficult to judge whether it's gonna be valuable or not. And then, you know, you just leave it open. And that's, you know, those are the reasons why we do this. <laughs> but don't worry, we'll talk about ways to help you resolve this later. <laughs> so we do have a couple of questions about tabs. Um, sure. So Felicity wants to know if there's a way to nest Safari tabs into groups. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I think that on Safari 15, the latest 15, they did start experimenting with groups. And I don't know if they ended up pulling it or not. Do you know, uh, Rex? Um, I don't know that it's a built-in feature now. I think it was in, I, I think it was in a beta. I think you're right. Um, but you now can leverage, um, extensions or add-ons to Safari. Um, so there may be something in the in the app store. I will say that that's something that I looked into not too terribly long ago and I did not find a solution. Um, Cause I was very, I am like a hardcore Safari user. It's one of my favorite browsers and I'm in deeply entrenched in the Apple ecosystem. So like it carries over my passwords and my two-factor authentication. So like I wanted to be able to have my cake and eat it too. And I wanted to be able to organize my tabs. Um, but I did not find something. I think it was maybe like a few weeks ago was the last time I looked. So. Um, oh, I, 
And I apologize, Felicity um, has specified, and I apologize. The question is, can you nest the actual groups? Oh. I apologize. You can group 10 tabs together in Safari. Okay, I'm gonna have to give that a try. I haven't done it. Oh, I got a feeling that you can't nest the groups. Probably not. <laughs> um, okay. I have used, I use, I'm a heavy Todoist user. Um, so I like offload things I wanna save to Todoist a lot too, to like put them in a project and, and keep my relevant links. Very cool. We have one other question about tabs as well. So um, I, actually, I think it popped into the chat window as well, but when updates are occurring, people are losing their tabs that they have open in their workspace. It's a big frustration and time waster. So is this a common problem or something that they are doing wrong is the question. Well, I can answer if, if I haven't used it in Safari, but if when you're closing Safari and you open it up and they're not there, that is probably a bug because they should remain. If you've put some effort into putting the group together, they should remain. So I would say that I don't think there's anything you're doing wrong. That sounds like a, a bug to me. Yeah, and I can tell you as a tab queen and a PC user that um, when your computer does restart on its own, you know, to do those updates um, in, in Google Chrome, you can go to history and reopen all of those lovely tabs. You can just go to recently closed and it'll pop those babies right back in for you. I'm not sure about Macs, but you can definitely do that on PCs. Yeah, that's that's a feature of Chrome on, on the Mac too as well. Perfect. There you go. Well, thank you for that, guys. I something new. I just I had to look and see the group. So thank you all for sharing that. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder I couldn't find an extension for it. It was built in. <laughs> <laughs> all righty. So I also think it's important when you're doing um, all of setting up your physical and digital workspace um, to have some fun. So I actually found a picture. I have these nano leaf lines in my in my office here, and it's so much fun. I will say it's addictive. You want to move them around constantly, so you have to get lots of 3M tape <laughs> to to move them around constantly. But um, it's something to have a nice little like moment. So whenever I need to like recoup or need to de-stress before a project or before starting a new task, um, I can turn these lights onto a cool light show. I can find a mindfulness app and sit down for five minutes and just listen and absorb the fun. Um, and it kind of resets your brain a bit, right? So that you can tackle that next project, probably the one that you didn't want to do um, with a little bit more excitement. Um, and like I mentioned, it does become addictive. So you have to add more and more. Um, so that's where I do, yeah, I pair the smart lighting with a, a mindfulness app for a moment of mindfulness. And there's some cool ones that actually are aware of smart lights in your space um, and will sync the, the music with the mindfulness app. There's also another cool app I absolutely adore called iLight Show. Um, and it, will pick up from your Spotify or your Apple Music what you're playing and it will beat sync the lights. And you can say like, I want these groups to be ambient light versus being like a, an active light that pulses with the beat. Um, so sometimes when you're in a groove and you're just doing your thing, you can have like a light show to go with it and you can feel like you're a rock star at your job. <laughs> so Rex, I also have the, I have the Nano Leaf elements. Which okay really love they're the ones that look like wood panels i have some too <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I just love them I, they're, they're uh, so cool um have you used the music beat sync on them yet oh yeah yeah it's so neat and i didn't realize when i was getting them that they would have such a drastic color change like yes. it's not a color light it's just uh temperature of, of white light but it's a pretty substantial difference it's really neat yeah, we won't we won't start talking about twinkly lights on your Christmas tree. I still am old school and have just regular lights, but mainly because my partner, I can't ever seem to get him excited about it. Um, so I'm like, I'm waiting to pull the trigger. And then this past year, I had a pre-lit tree, right? And it, some of them started dying. I was like, this is my year. This is my year to switch to smart Christmas lights. 
but we had already put the tree up and I was like, I don't know if I want to take everything apart to add these new smart lights. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say you will not be disappointed with Twinkly. You'll be extremely happy. I'm going to need to see some videos later. <laughs> Um, so now that we've talked about the physical space, your digital space, let's talk a little bit about the mental space, because I think this is a space where we all maybe don't spend a lot of time to really prepare ourselves for success. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Michael to talk about starting your day. All right. Thanks, Rex. Um, so one of the things I do is, you know, use the 80-20 uh, rule. Try to find the 20% of the tasks that is going to get 80% of your work done. We know that there are, and those essentially are they typically the larger tasks, the more important tasks that you need to do. But let me tell you, um, if you tackle those first, your feelings of accomplishment for the day go much higher. Um, and the other thing I do, which I find is extremely helpful and something I've really had to work on is when I start the day, I take time to write out the tasks that I actually want to accomplish that day. Um, you can do it on a piece of note paper. I put them in reminders on my Mac because then it, I can sort of, I get the real uh, feeling of satisfaction when I knock it off as done and it goes away. <laughs> it makes me feel good. Um, but I find that is a tap, that's really, really important. And like I mentioned, if you do the 80-20 rule, you're essentially, you know, I put shortest here, but really it's more of the most important tasks get done first. Sometimes you slip in a short one just to make yourself feel good, which is good. <laughs> now, minimizing distractions, this is really uh, important. And I can't emphasize this enough. And now, fortunately, our tools are beginning to actually align to this need. Um, so at the OS level, um, I know on the Mac, and I did it for today, there's a focus mode. You can just click on the button, put it in, put a time, and then all of the alerts, the desktop notifications are shut off. They just won't come in. And that's very, very important. The other thing that you can do is if you use Slack or Teams is set it to do not disturb. And, you know, for the periods that you want focus time. And I would recommend to align that with essentially, uh, and I'll talk about this in another point later, um, is blocking off time in the calendar. If you block off time in the calendar where people that you want to have focus time, people can't book a meeting with you, kind of align that with your Slack notification as well so people don't end up tapping you out on the shoulder and taking you out of your focus. Another item that I suggest you do is essentially batch check items. And what I mean by this is actually set up time in the day and you can put it in a calendar reminder as well, where you, because you're focused and you're not checking your mail, or getting these notifications, Slack notifications, you're focused on a specific piece of work, you can then take the 15 minutes to go, okay, now's the time I'm gonna go answer those emails, answer those Slack messages. The 15 minutes is done, you know, I put those away and now I go back into a focus period of time again. And then, like I mentioned earlier, blocking your calendar and align that with your Slack notifications, I think is critical. Now, the last thing I wanna talk about is getting organized. And by getting organized, what I really mean is, you know, kind of doing an inventory of your stuff. You know, many of us, you know, I talked earlier about sharing your desktop or sharing your browser. Um, many of us have desktops that are littered with files, folders, whatnot. I have a bunch of folders. I often put it there, you know, we just have, this idea, for me anyways, I put folders that I'm working on most often on the desktop because it's just kind of a reminder. But, you know, we're not very good at going over time and sort of cleaning up, putting them, filing them in the right place. So the first thing you wanna do for this is set aside a specific period of time to actually do the cleanup. 
And if you're going to delete stuff, make sure you do a backup first, just in case you end up deleting something that you may need later. The next thing is to do an app inventory. Many of us um, download apps, try things out, whatnot. And over time, whether it's your desktop or your phone, um, you have apps that you're not using. Go through, delete the ones you don't need, get them out of there. Um, organizing your email and use the FAST method. The FAST method is just, it's really just an acronym. Uh, the F stands for file. So an email comes in. If it's something that needs to be filed, file it. Um, if you're like me and Rex, you probably have a bunch of rules that auto file many of your emails coming in. Uh, that's what I like to do. Um, the next thing, the A in FAST is assign it. If it's something that you can assign to a colleague, or someone that reports to you, do it right away. You know, you're triaging your email as it come in, comes in. Um, and the S stands for store. You know, if you want to store it in a place, much like filing, but it's, you know, sometimes I put it as an archive method just to archive it. So it's there, but it's not actually something that you've put into a specific folder. You're just archiving it. And then finally, the T is for trash it. You know, obviously spam, obvious spam goes to trash. But if it's something that you go, ah, oh, you know what? I'm never going to have to deal with this. Just delete it. Get it out. And one of the things I do, and if you use Gmail, um, many of us get, um, you know, we subscribe to newsletters or you sign up for stuff and you're getting newsletters from companies. Um, in Gmail, you have the ability to... Uh, click on a button that allows you to sort of block and unsubscribe from that email. I use that all the time. These are good signals back to the company um, that, you know, perhaps, you know, they shouldn't be sending you that email, which is important. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Um, on this, oh, sorry, I have one more, I forgot. This is a very important item. Um, using a password manager, again, this is really critical, uh, for keeping your life organized. I don't know how many of you have a website or have gone to, and you know, you set up an account and you go to it later and you didn't save it and you can't remember it and you have to look for it or try. A password manager, not only does it make you more secure, because these tools are, can be very secure, but it autofills often when you go to that website and it saves you time and often can make you secure at, at the same time. So it's a win-win. So I highly recommend using a password manager. And, you know, a lot of our browsers today have built-in password management features and they're good um, and often are getting better. Um, the benefit of an independent password manager is that they work with multiple browsers if you're having to switch or on different desktops or whatnot. It just gives you a little bit more independence if you're not tied to a specific browser. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you have any recommendations, Michael, on a password manager? There are many good ones out there. I use LastPass, uh, but 1Password is good. There's some open source ones that are excellent. Um, I think the Apple of, one's fabulous now too, and it syncs with Windows now. Which one is that? The, the built-in Apple one, iCloud. Oh, okay. And it has built-in two-factor authentication now too, like OnePass. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Bitwarden. I've not heard of that one before. Yeah, Bitwarden is excellent. Okay. It sounds very secure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So as Michael mentioned, when you're getting started, it's really important to, to plan. And this is something that I'm really interested in. Um, in my grad studies, um, I focus a lot on the planning phase of learning, um, but it's also uh, really important in anything that you're doing. Um, 
And it's oftentimes the most skipped over part of our process and whatever we're doing. And like some of the research studies were interesting. They were following um, the planning phase in sports or in athletics, right? And so even something as simple as visualizing the whole task before doing it has a profound impact on the accuracy and, and the success of the action. So um, when you think about it in the context of your workday, it can become even more impactful because you take a moment to identify the entire process. And then from that, you can build in automations, you can build in shortcuts to, to the goal, right? Um, so uh, it is very important to give more time to the planning phase to sit down and do what's called process mapping. So writing out from beginning to end, what steps are going to be taken, especially focusing on what steps are mine, what steps are from someone else or that need to go into a different software solution or need to process through a database of some sort. And you see all of the in and out points of, of the process. And that's where you can start to say like, okay, maybe I want to use Microsoft Flow or Zapier, um, which are automation software um, that allow you to say like, for example, uh, I'm one thing that I do um, is in Slack, if I get a message from a teammate that I think is really important and I think I want to reuse it, I have a Zap setup that will take that text from the from Slack and throw it and create throw it into Zapier and create um, a snippet for me in Text Expander. So then I can go back later and just use an abbreviation to expand that text and, and, and use it with someone else. Um, another thing that I use a lot with Zapier is um, moving data from our CRM uh, into, uh, into my notes for a client or um, keeping data connected and synced or getting it to automatically do a couple of processes that I would normally have to go through and click to do. Um, when you identify those moments, if they're repetitive, anytime that you do something repetitive, take a moment and sit down to think about, can I automate this in some way? Is there a solution out here that lets me um, not have to do this anymore. And I think a really great thing to do when you're thinking about these sorts of opportunities is to sit down and think about like, what do I not want to do? And really focus there because if those are going to be those productivity sucks, right? Like they're going to take away your motivation. So if you can take them off your plate, you're going to have a better, clearer cognitive space to work in. Um, so I'm all about process mapping. I think Jennifer can attest to that because I'm always saying we should process map that. <laughs> um, and then I can attest to that for sure. <laughs> also, um, effort does not always equate to productivity. Um, and in fact, more often than not, it does not. The harder that you, the, when you feel like you're being very effortful, it's very likely that your amygdala is releasing certain glucocorticoids that are impeding your brain's ability to send or store and retrieve information, right? And so everything that you do thereafter becomes much more difficult. So take off the pressure, release the valve. And one of my favorite ways to do this is the Pomodoro method. And it's called the Pomodoro method because when invented, the uh, folks were using, the researchers were using a tomato timer and Pomodoro is Italian for tomato. Um, and so I always, every time I think of Pomodoro method, I think of this tomato timer you see on the screen. Um, and one thing you can do with that is like Michael said, write out your tasks for the day and really identify the ones that are important. But our brains do love change and they love, um, there's this idea of the bathtub effect of information. So like if you think of a clawfoot bathtub and the person in it, their head sticking out and their feet are sticking out so that the beginning and the end are what we usually remember about what we're doing. And so if we shorten the time between the beginning and the end of a task or of, of something we're trying to learn or something we're trying to accomplish, we have more productivity across the whole process of, of that micro process. You also, if you look in the literature right now, there's tons of information on micro learning. And that's really like the future of how we process information. We're very busy now. Um, so if it can't be distilled down into a short bit, the, there's going to be a lot of lost information. There might be a lot of, if we're trying to accomplish a task, there might be a lot of like spinning our wheels, right? And so the Pomodoro method allows us to break large tasks into smaller little constituent pieces. So you start with your list of like, I need to accomplish these five things today. And then you decide, okay, I think for me, my attention spans about 15 minutes. So I'm gonna spend 15 minutes 
on each of these tasks. And I'll take a two minute break in between and move to the next one. When I get to the bottom of my list, I take a 10, 15 minute break, go get a snack, have a glass of tea, and then start back at the top of the list. And you will see such an increase in your productivity. Um, and there's some also extra cognitive benefits. So there's this idea of interleaving of information. And so when you're switching between tasks, you're actually helping your brain create new neural pathways to disparate pieces of information. So um, even though it may seem like there's not a, a, a relationship between, um, you know, creating a zap for a process that, that you do frequently and answering some emails, the fact that you're interleaving the tasks, your brain's going to make a connection or an association, and it's going to be easier to do that task again in the future because you have a stronger neural pathway. And I always think of neural pathways as like highways. And the more that you can say, hey, brain, this is important stuff, it's going to keep adding lanes to that highway. Um, so the, the Pomodoro method or interleaving and intermixing what you're doing tells your brain, hey, this is important. It relates to these other things. Let's build a really strong neural pathway here. And now we can more easily retrieve that information later when we need to use it again. So I think there's a way to hack what you're doing. I always like to think of like learning and, and, and working as something that's hackable. And so find your flow, find what works for you, really pay attention to when, not that you shouldn't push and persevere when you encounter difficulty. And we do grow through difficult tasks, but also recognize when the difficulty is no longer serving you. If it's not improving you or increasing your productivity, that's a moment to reevaluate how you're approaching that task. Um, so interleave and intermixing, definitely give it a try and see if you notice a difference. And my other favorite uh, jargon term is metacognition. Be very aware of how you're thinking. And through that, you will, you will find better ways to work and get and accomplish your goals. And that brings me back to automating it again. Spend some time with your virtual assistant. Um, figure out what things it can do for you. Um, I have, and sadly, I've underutilized this, but Siri shortcuts on Apple, it can do so many things. And I'm sure that there are plenty of things that it can do that would replace uh, me having to do it myself. Um, so definitely go get in and check it out. If you're on Windows, um, they just made Microsoft Power Automate, uh, not just, but recently, um, that allows you to have it control applications on your desktop and accomplish tasks. You can train it to like click in certain places for you. And I think this is a really great area um, to grow for all of us because we all have those things that we do on a daily basis that we could train a program to do for us. Um, and, and to execute a, a workflow, if you will. Um, so definitely spend some time um, working with your virtual assistant, working with your ecosystems that you're working in, you know, and figure out what it can do for you. At the time that you spend, I don't think will ever be a wasted amount of time. Also figure out how you can interconnect the different solutions that you use. So, you know, I mentioned we use Slack and we obviously use Text Expander. Um, and so interconnecting those two with a software solution like Zapier is a really great opportunity to reduce the, the tasks I have to do. Um, so definitely spend some time, again, process mapping. What all am I using in a day? How are these interconnected? Are there solutions that help me tie these together? Um, and I think that's a really great way to save yourself some time and be more productive. Um, and so that's my automate step. <laughs> so it looks like that brings us to the end of our presentation. So um, today we've covered physical tips like how to stay fresh and leverage uh, awesome cameras for some 1080p glory, um, how to automate some processes both in your physical space and your digital space, leveraging the technology you already have, and how to interject some fun into your process so that like you're recharging yourself as you accomplish things. Um, Michael, I'll let you talk about our digital tips. For sure. Um, again, Zoom overload. Uh, if you have the chance to, you know, utilize a camera that you have sitting around, do it. Um, and, you know, remember uh, Rex's tip on the virtual cameras is also excellent. Tab overload. Um, you know, we didn't really talk a lot about how, you know, I have the, the solutions for that other than once you recognize 
that you have a problem and the challenges around it. There are tools out there. I'll, uh, I'll do a, a shameful uh, plug for Shift. It can actually help you manage uh, tab overload to some degree because it ends up putting some of those tabs into Shift in a more, more coherent manner. So, you know, please feel free to check that out. And then, you know, um, Rex talking about automating. Um, we both love our smart tools and I'm using Siri all the time to do things around the house. I'm using voice commands for a bunch of things. And then if you're using tools to help uh, automate, whether it's a task manager like Todoist, um, I use Apple's reminders and notes all the time in my model to work. Everyone, that's the one thing we found out about productivity. It's a very personal thing. Um, everyone has their own method. Um, and I think these larger tips that we've talked about today um, just help create frameworks to help you sort of manage this world we live in where we're just overwhelmed with things that we need to do and get done. So these are just frameworks to help you get a hold of them. And then back to you, Rex, to talk about the, the mental tips. Yeah, I think it's really important to give ourselves grace and provide space for us to figure it out. And I think that's why we don't spend as much time mapping it out, making a plan, doing that process mapping. So I'm here to tell you, I'm giving you permission to spend that little bit of extra time and map out your day and figure out your opportunities to take some things off of your plate. If you don't ever give yourself that time, you're, it's just going to continue to snowball and it gets harder and harder as you move along. Also remember that there is a limit to how much effort can, can actually be useful. So uh, there's a, 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 the, the jargon buzzword for that is desirable difficulty. So if you wanna look up research on that, they, they're tracking like how much difficulty is actually useful before it becomes something that is a detriment to, to the goal. Um, so definitely work smarter, not harder. And like Michael mentioned, start your days prepared. Take that minute, that few minutes at the beginning of your day to think about what do I need to accomplish? What are my heavy topics that have to be done? What are my, I would like to get this done, but I'm not going to beat myself up if I don't. Um, and finding processes that work with your own style of cognition, where, you know, the idea of neurodiversity, we're all different. There's no one size fits all. Um, so definitely be metacognitive and think about your, how you're thinking and what's working for you and, and make, if you need, make notes about it. Keep a little journal about like, what's my workflow and how, what's working for me. And that will really help you refine your process and become like a super uh, productive uh, process manager, if you will. <laughs> That's awesome. And Michael, I don't know if you saw, there's a specific question for you in the questions room. If you don't mind, I'll have you um, respond to that. Thank you. Ah, that's great. Um, yes, if you have a specific app that you want to suggest that's not in our, um, in our repository of apps that we have, and we have close to 2,000 now, just go to um, tryshift.com and go to our support link. And go in there and just write out a, in our support form, just say a suggestion for a ticket. Um, I know, I think Jessica, our customer success manager is here. If there's a better link that you want them to go into, Jessica, why don't you just pop it in the general chat there uh, if you're still online. But other than that, just go to our support area on our website and suggest an app there. And we will add it to our list and we're continuing to add uh, probably 20 to 30 every couple of weeks. That's cool. Shift is awesome for sure. Um, so that's the end of our presentation. Please let us know if you have any questions, but also you have our contact information here and links to our website. We will be sharing this recording with you and the slide deck so you can peruse it at your at your leisure. Um, but definitely reach out to us when you have questions and let us know how these suggestions are working for you. We love to hear your feedback. Awesome. And I did wanted to say there, Jessica did put a, spe a specific link in the chat to suggest apps, which is uh, you know, is better than just going to the general support form. So please use that. 
And I really want to thank uh, Rex and the whole Tex Expander team uh, for hosting us today and making this webinar happen. Um, it's been a real joy to work with you guys. Ditto. Thank you for, the, for doing this webinar with us. It's been a great joy. Definitely. Thank you, Michael, and the whole SHIP team. Yeah. And thank you, Rex, for your hard work as well. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, everyone. This is a yes. mutual liberation society for sure. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely.